today, maybe, is to talk about the creation of place in the English Morris Darwin's tradition. Now, I'm, going to, I'm working on a principle that a lot of you won't know much about Morris Darwin's beyond kind of fairly superficial and yeah, prejudicial ideas of what the tradition actually consists of. So I'm going to do a little bit of kind of background work to explain the tradition, talk about the revival, and then look at how the Morris revival of the 20th century has attempted to embed itself within places uh, because in, in the Morris tradition, the notion of place and origin and authenticity is very, very important in the way it's developed as a, as a, as a traditional genre. There are a series of more of uh, traditional dance traditions uh, within, within uh, England. Um, many different types all coming under the rubric of, of Morris dance. So you've got things like Molly dance in East Anglia, you've got Northwestern Morris traditions, you've got Border Morris traditions. What I'm going to talk about is the Cotswold Morris tradition, which is perhaps the most uh, widely recognised form of Morris dance. Morris dance is a public display dance. It's something that, it's a, in its origins in the, in the post medieval period, it's essentially a rural proletarian tradition. Um, as you can see from these big looking lads up here from Chicken Camden, these are, it's a dance tradition mainly carried out by young men. It's a homosocial uh, phenomenon. They are primarily rural agricultural workers, and forget all the pagan rubbish about you know kind of neo Fraserian kind of the golden bow stuff. It's basically as it has in many ways today, but going out, getting money, getting drunk, getting pissed, having a laugh. It's never had any kind of deeper meaning, frankly, than an opportunity to make a bit of spare cash and, and spend it on beer. Um, in terms of its regional locality, although it's called Cotswold Forest, it's really more of a South Midlands tradition. Um, this, is, this is a map um, from Keith Chandler's really important work plotting the pre revival location of Morris Dance sites. And you can see it's mainly Oxford to Oxford there, far and stuff there. So it's really South Midlands, partly the Cotswolds, but also going up into North Hampshire and, and North Oxfordshire. Um, it's normally the size consists of uh, six, six men, uh, traditionally wearing white with the bells, uh, sometimes using handkerchiefs, sometimes using sticks. And there's uh, the musical components important. Traditionally, the music provided by this uh, drummer pipe, Whittle and Dub, as it's known in, in, in the trade, uh, with a fiddle coming in in the late 19th century, and then things like Melodium to Constantinus coming in in the 20th century folk revival. Um, one of the important things about Morris dance is it's a socially embedded phenomenon. It's something which took place within the context of important customary events within the annual agricultural cycle. So we have things, particularly Whitsun, um, and associated kind of May-related festivities, when we look at the documentary references to it, Whitsun ales, as they were called, or feasts, which were basically village parties, uh, often run by the local friendly societies, which were kind of proto-insurance uh, companies, essentially. Um, you also need to be take place associated with things like harvest time, fairs, sometimes they would go on tour, so it's occasionally even in the 19th century, Morris Star Sides would go up to London because you can make quite a bit of money by doing that. Also, it was embedded in things like uh, local elections, um, and occasionally they'd be paid to go up to, go up to the big house to carry out the work. But crucially, it's a, it, it was a spatially localised uh, phenomenon. It grew on local people from the local village of London. The local dance for local people. Um, <laughs> but it's embedded within agricultural calendar um, context. As a phenomenon that almost dies out by the end of the 19th century, for a whole series of reasons. Uh, there's, there's a crackdown by uh, particularly by the Church of England on what seems unauthorised or inappropriate seasonal festivities. Um, uh, there's changes in, in, in agricultural society in these periods. But we, just as it's about to die out, we see, uh, a, two, we see a revival process taking place. First of all, uh, in the late 19th century, particularly in the Oxfordshire area, uh, we see Percy Manning, who's an Oxford antiquarian, then followed by Cecil Sharp, who's the figure perhaps the most widely associated with the Morris Revival, and also Mary Neal are the, are the three people who really started the Morris Dance Revival. Here we see the English Folk Dance Star Society demonstration being 1914. I think four of them died in World War I, that's George Butterworth. 
uh, some of you might know, the composer. Um, and that initially sparked the revival of Morris dancing. Um, as as um, not surprisingly, the way these things work out, the new wave of revivalist Morris dancers tend to be very different social demographic, tend to be educated, particularly Oxford and Cambridge, um, also uh, uh, people with particular interest in wider folk song and folk music traditions, and people like Percy Granger and Ralph Vaughan Williams are very important for that initial revival. We then see a second revival in the late 60s, early 70s, basically goes hand in hand with things like the emergence of folk rock, steel arts, band, 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 convention, that kind of thing, uh, to do work of Ashley Hutchings, and there's a new kind of revival in uh, English, English Morris dance. And, and that's the point at which it really exponentially grows as a revival tradition. So we have a massive increase in Morris sites. So now, well, the latest census figures, about 780 individual Morris sites. So there are more Morris dancers now than there ever were in 181890. 18, we see a change in social context. These are no longer obviously agricultural proletarian labourers. These are people, I mean, I, I dance, and on my side, we've got a range of people from university lecturers, uh, people working in catering, uh, retired people, people working in the chocolate factory in York. We've got a very wide social demographic that I'm pretty sure that none of us work on farms. Um, because that change in social context results in a change in spatial context of Morris Dance, which is really what I want to talk about. We see this junction from sides focused on the locality who don't move around much to sides which move around much, go and dance in other places. And this is really important because we're starting to see um, a problematisation of association between dances and a particular space. Now, one way in which Morris dance addressed that is back in the, night, in the early 20th century when Morris dance traditions were being uh, recorded, they would be uh, for like Sharp would go to someone like Bampton in Oxfordshire, he'd record a set of dances, and he would kind of create a tradition out from that particular place, often only based on one or two sets of recording, but he would kind of crystallise that as a the Bampton tradition. It was actually known these dance styles are fluid, but the Morris revival started that process of crystallisation of dance traditions, like sets of steps, sets of tunes, and, this, and linking them in to particular specific villages. We also see a massive expansion just beyond the traditional Morris area. So most lots of teams outside, um, outside the South Midlands. There's teams in Japan, there's teams in the, in the States, there's teams in New Zealand. You know, it, 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 it's kind of a, a global phenomenon. So we see an increased mobility of, of sites. So my question is, how does this impact on changing relationships to place? Traditionally, Morris is seen in, in the 19th in the, in the century as something on a local, a local side drawn from people employed in individual village, largely dancing in their own parish or in the neighbouring parishes. But we've lost that, that link with space. And there's four key ways in which Morris art traditions have um, changed. Um, first of all, we see um, the elaboration extension of traditional sites. So places like Bampton and Abingdon, which are two sides where of two of those <coughs> four cases of unbroken traditions where there's no death and revival of Morris dance, we see these places continuing to be very, very important. These are kind of the touchstones of the Morris tradition. And as you can see, they are with the Bampton, it's a Whitson celebration, Abingdon is a celebration of something called the Mayor of Oxford Street, where they vote an unofficial mayor for a street in one of the, in, in one of the, in the, in, in the town. Um, and these, these are the kind of these touchstone locations because they have that unbroken continuity with the original tradition. Um, in these cases, the importance of things like regalia are very important. So the so called Ox Street horns, which always come out when the Dowling inside dances, along with a, a rosewood cup, a sword, these are the cake tins of, um, of a fountain, these are the importance of. of individual aspects of material culture is really important in mediating this connection between sides and particular, particular places. The second way in which we see um, a relationship with um, places being developed is through the notion of pilgrimage. You, have to, know, you only have to go back to the 1920s to see amongst the revival sides an impulse to go and revisit the places from which Morris came from. People like Sharp largely took it away from the original villages it became quite rarefied, but there was an impulse by, by young Morris dancers in the 20s to try and get back 
to what they saw as the, 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 the source of the tradition. So the growth of something called the Travelling Morris, the delivery of archaic spelling, uh, with a group of many Cambridge students who went back, touring places like the Cotswolds, going back, speaking to the original dancers. And this idea of pilgrimage is very important. We still see sides, particularly from abroad, coming back to England and going back and dancing in those traditional villages, places like Atterbury and Bampton, from where the original dances were collected. We also see the creation of new places, new, new places in the store which are connected to the heritage and the story of the Morris dance. For example, Staxley in Essex, a place which never had traditional Morris dance in the past, but a key figure, Conrad Noel, the red priest of Thaxted, who flew the, the, the red flag and the flag of Sinn Féin next to St George's Cross in the church in the 1920s, uh, a radical Christian socialist. He was obsessed with the idea of bringing dance and celebration into Christian worship. It was in Saxon in the 1930s that the Morris Ring, one of the big organisations, was founded. And it's become a, a place of pilgrimage, an annual festival. It's become a heritage place. And the Morris Ring actually have uh, sponsored the hanging of a new bell in the 1920s, depicting Morris dancers um, in, the, in, in, in the church tower. Um, Some like Sidmouth, which is in the folk festival, founded in the 50s by the English Folk Song and Dance Society, becomes again, although it notionally a new festival, it has become a site where Morris, Morris's history is played out. It's a place where we have Morris dance competitions, not just mass dance, but, but, but individual sides, jigs, that kind of thing. Um, and that, that has again become a, a, a heritage site in its own right. People look back, people have written histories of the similar folk festival tradition. So we're seeing yet another way of creating new places. And finally, the process of memorialisation, something I've, I've, I've written about in the past. This is a Headington, um, where Cecil Sharp first encounters uh, Morris Dancing, a guy called William Kimber, uh, who was the leader of the Morris Dancing side there. This is Kimber's gravestone with his bells and his concertina on. We have road names, we have blue plaques, we have original plaques, there's Kimber's long man, seeing the uh, plaque being put up at the very place where he first encountered Cecil Sharp. So we're seeing a process of more formalised memorialisation, the, the blue placardization of, of Morris Dance. We're seeing these semi-formal creations of memorialised landscapes. So, revival is related to authenticity. There's lots of things to unpack here. We don't have time to do. One very important thing to think about is the notion of Englishness, um, which Morris has kind of come to represent, even though actually its origin is very much a localised regional tradition, but it's been reworked, a very kind of inflected notion of what national identity is connected to. Morris dance also, although it's a symbol of Englishness, sits politically uncomfortably because a lot of the revival is drawn from people, drawn by people connected to the left rather than the right. So it's a fairly ambiguous and uh, symbol of national identity. I think it's important to draw out the differences between how people perceive Morris externally and how people perceive it internally. Morris artists themselves are much more aware of the importance of the place as touched on than the audience are. Um, so I'll draw, I'll draw a line there. I've just kind of had to raise, just raise some, some big issues there. I've, I've, stuff I've, I'm writing about increasingly at the moment. I may work on any of these things, so it's just a side project. Um, but I, I, I spent a bit of time in the video, but there are some links there if you want to hear what Morris artists looks like and sounds like. Thank you very much.